everyone has a story. The automotive world is surrounded by some of the most passionate people on the planet. There's builders, collectors, and craftsmen who all have something to tell. stories and steel hot rodding by nature tends to be generational very often it's passed from one to the next in terms of style build technique or even the vehicles themselves on this episode of stories and steel brad stops in for a visit with doug jerger of squeegee's customs in mesa arizona a second generation builder and custom painter of the highest caliber if you've ever wondered what it takes to run a high-end shop or to win the AMBR purely by accident, you're going to want to stay tuned. That's the first time I've been in your shop. I, I like this place. I am, I'm, I'm kind of blown away how you got this thing all set up. It's a pretty, it's a pretty slick little deal. What, what is the name? What is the name Squeege's? Where did that Squeege. come from? Well, my dad's name uh, is Squeege. He got it when he was, he was born. They brought him home from the hospital, and when he'd cry, it sounded like a squeegee drug across glass. So his grandfather <laughs> gave him squeegee, and it actually stuck. So that was always his nickname, mm -hmm. the squeegee? Squeegee, and then it, then it turned into squeege. Okay. And he always had an E at the end, uh, up until, I think it was the late 70s, he dropped the E. Might have been late or early 80s. He dropped the E because everybody would call him squeegee, and he wanted to be called squeegee, so he dropped the E. That's how the name became. So, and then when I went to work for him in 86, uh, and he eventually retired in 04, I mean, I'm not going to change the name of the shop to Doug's. Right. So, that's just, that's how it is. You've kind of followed in his footsteps. Very much. Did you want to, did you want to do what he did? Did you want to do more than what he was doing? I mean, what no, was No, I just wanted to do, I mean, ever since I can remember, I've always just wanted to do what he did. I mean, he was my ultimate hero growing up, all through school and high school that's that's all it mattered is is coming out to arizona i grew up in ohio and it wasn't until 1986 when i graduated high school i moved out here two weeks after i graduated i was here to go to work for my dad when we'd write letters to dad you know mom would go okay time to write letters to dad well i'd, I'd draw pictures of cars and dragsters and and uh, it's funny because i would draw out a dragster and go here's an idea for paint job and i would you know mail this to him and lo and behold he'd, he'd saved all those I didn't know he did but it's kind of neat to see all my old stuff I drew when I was a kid but yeah I've always wanted to do uh, this in fact I don't I'm not sure what the hell I'd do if, if it wasn't for this I mean I, I don't know this is all I know I don't know I mean it, it's funny sometimes you get into a group of people that don't know anything about cars and it's very hard to talk to them you know they start talking about sports and I don't know anything about sports you know or they start talking politics or I don't want to talk any of that I just want to talk cars so all my close friends I mean we're all just car guys so yeah it, it, it was always a passion for me to, to come out here work for my dad learn everything I could from my dad when I grew up in Ohio when it came to high school my grades weren't that good because I drew pictures all the time and dragsters to mail to dad right, right. so I, yeah I was always screwing around drawing things and I was the kid that never turned in his homework I did just enough to get by and then it came to high school they offered uh, different trades. They offered auto body, and they offered auto mechanics, and machine trade, and others. And uh, everybody just thought, well, if, if you're gonna be like your dad, you're probably wanting to take auto body. I decided, no, I'm gonna learn that out here. Um, I need to learn everything else about a car. So I took auto mechanics for two years, which was huge, because by the time I moved out here, I, I knew more about how a car operates, how, uh, drive trains, work brakes, and that kind of thing. I, you know, the basics. So when I came out here, I immediately, and, and I screwed with painting back in Ohio for uh, throughout high school. You know, I'd do buddies' uh, cars, like uh, stripes on them or whatever. I had a 61 VW Bug. Um, you know, all my buddies would have cars, and th their main thing was get a car and drive to high school. 
and uh, the entire time in high school I had this 61 VW Bug and all I did was work on it. I never, I think maybe I put 20 miles on it total in the entire time I owned it. I, I worked, um, worked on it about 20 miles is about all I put on it because I worked on it all the time. And the, and the way I got the Bug is I uh, grew up in Mansfield, Ohio and uh, I worked on a farm baling hay, that kind of thing, save my money, go down the street and buy parts for the bug and work on it. And I mean, it was a rust bucket. And, uh, a friend of mine painted it for me. His dad painted it for me. I had some leftover military paint, uh, yellow, so they painted it yellow. And my dad sent me a set of moon discs. I put those on it. And I, my first flame job I did is on it. And it's horrible. <laughs> but <laughs> it's, I did it all my own, you know. I right. just kind of looked at the way dad did things. Like when we'd come out here and visit, my brother and I would come out and visit in the 70s, just sit around bored off our butt because, you know, dad's busy. So we'd always find something to do, like I'd get a panel and, dad, how do we get this so I can paint it? Well, get some primer on it, so I'd prime it, and then now what do I do? And then sand it. You know, I'm, I'm probably like eight, nine years old. And then he'd help me lay out a flame or whatever, and I'd paint it, and then he would stripe it, because back then he was striping. And, and so I, that, I treasured that panel, you know, that I painted that summer at dad's. I mean, ever since I can remember, that's all I wanted to do is learn how to custom paint and then cars and that kind of thing. Yeah, two weeks after I graduated high school, I went to work out here and dad sat me down. And he says, well, I got, a, I got a buddy that does air conditioning. Now you can learn how to do air conditioning and get a job doing that, or you can go to work in the shop. I said, well, I want to work in the shop. At that time, he had the hot rod connection, early 80s. Um, but I, I, that was it. I, I would work all day in the body shop, paint shop, and then jump in my Beetle and uh, I would drive that all the way to Phoenix, from Mesa to Phoenix, just to hang out in the hot rod shop until it was time to go home. Right. I mean, it was just, I wanted to be around it. At night, I would, um, you know, behind the paint shop, they had panels, uh, old fenders and hoods and that. I would always, I would go from there back to the paint shop because dad gave us, or gave me a key. So I'd go, and I'd stay at, at the shop till 11.30 at night, just screwing around with paint, you know, laying out stuff and it was all lacquers and I, I grew up painting lacquers that's what I did and then I go home at midnight and then next morning go do the whole thing over again and that's what I did all the weekends if, if I wasn't at the shop on the weekends I was at least out with my buddy out in the desert driving around just checking out stuff because it was Arizona it was quite a difference from Ohio and I stayed out of trouble I mean I wasn't into wasn't too much into partying at that time you know I just I like being at the shop so I drove that Baja bug. I mean, back in the 80s, 86, 87, uh, Central in downtown Phoenix was huge where you'd cruise. Uh, you'd cruise all, all night Saturday night. I mean, it was three lanes and bumper to bumper to each lane. It was awesome. You know, just it was all custom stuff out there cruising between mini trucks and lowered bugs to hot rods and everything, street racers, everything. It was just a place to go. And so I always spend my, my nights out there on the weekends. And uh, one night, a uh, guy turned in front of me and I crashed this Baja bug and it totaled it. So um, being it was the guy's fault, of course, the insurance paid for it and I was out looking for another car and I found a uh, 56 oval window bug just down the street from the shop for 1500 bucks and I got it and I started driving it. And then of course, tore it apart and started getting that ready. You couldn't, couldn't leave it alone. Oh, absolutely not. So that was, and, and dad was very strict, you know, it, uh, eight to five, it was work at the shop. At 501, you can work on your own stuff. So at night I'd stop and start work. And I, I did all kinds of crazy stuff. I mean, it's the stuff we did to cars in the eighties isn't exactly accepted today. I mean, it, obviously it's dated. I mean, I painted it a hot pink and I smoothed the drip rail like in the back, I tapered it and on the cowl, I shaved it and uh, the dash, I smoothed out. 56 oval, you typically don't do this, but you know, smooth it out, put a, a Marfab billet aluminum uh, gauge panel there and had billet squeege mirrors on it. And, um, That's a cool little bug. Yeah, it was slammed pretty low and I welded the headlight rings on, molded those in, you know, with the, the glass over style headlights, early ones. and. Uh, painted it hot pink and it had like a splash design on the bottom. In fact, I think I'd got that from a Stanford rendering that, that inspired me to do that. And I mean, it was trick. Then they photographed that for Hot VWs and I was just like I that. remember the car. I do remember the, the car. The pink yeah. old window. Yeah. So I was just totally stoked. 
And then it just from there, I'm like, okay, I got to keep doing. So I, I finally sold it, and then I bought a Manx dune buggy, or a copy, and um, fixed it up, lowered it, put cool wheels on it, cool paint, and I did that. And then it moved on, and finally built a Nova, and I'm still working for my dad, and 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 he his, his never really paid me really good. I mean, he, I know I get it; he couldn't afford it. Um, but we at that time it was about 87 or so he closed down the hot rod connection and uh he went back to work at the paint shop so uh i went working for him but we never really got along uh working together i mean he um he was always grouchy always angry always told me when i did something wrong never really told me when i did something right uh, i remember once one time <laughs> um <laughs> We had a Ferrari, a 72 Dino, that we were restoring. By the way, back then we hand rubbed everything. I don't know if you remember okay. lacquers, but everything was hand rubbed, including urethane. He made me hand rub this damn glazer wow. urethane. We were hand rubbing and then finished it off with a buffer, hand rub polish, whatever. So we got this car. I mean, it's beautiful. And we're just finishing it up. The engine's out of it, it's out getting rebuilt. And the way dad worked was, He'd take the project and he would take some money up front and then we'd work on it and it took a year, it took a year and then you pay at the end, which I can understand why he didn't have a lot of money. It was, you know, it, there, there was no cash flow. So I don't know how long, I can't remember how long this Ferrari took. It may not took a year, but uh, so it's sitting there. We got it all finished and the car, they're, they're coming after the car tomorrow. The owner's coming to get it to go get the engine put back in. Well, when he's coming, he's going to pay up. And so we had kind of a, our shop at the time, we only had 1,600 square foot bay, and then right next door was another 1,600 square foot, and there were like two different shops, but we were in both of them. So the, the shop was just full of like stuff we were doing, and we did a lot of custom painting back then. So it was a lot of trucks and Suburbans and, you know, just a lot of stuff. Anyhow, it was a loaded shop, and, and he's trying to squeeze this car in. It's late at night and we worked all day and he's trying to get this car in. Well, the Ferrari's kind of in the way and I ran over there while he's trying to pull in and I started pushing the Ferrari forward and I'm looking back to see if he got in. Well, there in front of it was a Suburban without a bumper on it and that frame horn went right into that surround, you know, right oh, in front of the, the hood, no. just caved it in. I was, <laughs> I was just like terrified. So he just takes and parks whatever it was in the shop and he gets out, he looks at the Ferrari, doesn't say a word and he leaves. And I'm like, I'm terrified, I'm gonna get. I'm a dead man. I'm a dead man. <laughs> I mean, we're supposed to get paid by the, for this tomorrow. We're not gonna get paid now. So the night goes on and the next day I go to work and uh, he put the, the Ferrari over in the corner and he starts this hammer and down. He took the hood off, starts popping this dent out, screwing around with it. And well, where, where the Ferrari is, is where the cabinet is for the sandpaper. So I'm in the back you know, behind the shop, we have an awning, and that's where the booth was, and that's where we did all the prep work. So I'm back there just sanding whatever it is I'm working on. But I remember using the, all the sandpaper to the, it was like no grit left, because I didn't want to walk up next to Dad while he's with a Ferrari. I didn't want to bug him. I want to see you. I know I this, is a, see me. this is a time bomb. So finally, I just, I had to get a piece of paper. So I walk over there, and he and I'm getting a piece of paper and he stops and boom, he explodes. Just starts yelling at me about, and, and I get it. I mean, and he's all pissed off and he takes his body hammer and he slams it down on the bench. Well, it broke and the head flew up and landed square on top of the deck lid, which was laying on the ground. <laughs> so it was just not a good day. <laughs> but that that's just working with my dad and, um, he just, he was very difficult to work with. I mean, there was times where he'd get so pissed at me, I, there would be a Bink 7 flying across the shop at me. I mean, he'd just get pissed. And I can talk about this now because he's a, such a sweetheart today. I mean, he's such a super nice guy to be around. He's, he's just, it's the dad, that way dad should have been. But, and I never really understood at the time working for him why he was always angry but i get it now i mean it's tough to make a living at this and especially when you're not charging enough and you know you're trying to make ends meet and 
here you got a son that if he screws something up, it's out of his pocket, and it, it just, and I get it why he was angry all the time. But as the years um, went on, and I took over more of the painting, and, and we were pushing stuff out, and, and I think we were making money, and, and, and he was able to start putting money away to, to be able to retire. Um, things got better between us. And now that he's been away, like I said, he, he's just so pleasurable to be around. He's just a, just a sweet guy, just the, the nicest guy you could ever meet. Um, and he's got to be proud of what, you, what he's seen. He's, you, yeah, he is. And, and that's what I did all my life. That's all I wanted to do is make my dad proud of me. That, that was my whole drive. You know, even when I was back in Ohio, I just, I'd draw him pictures and, and hope to hear something, you know. And then move out here and anything I did, I'd always look at my dad's reaction. Of, and I never really got it. But now, now that he's, he's on his own and retired in the South, I mean, now he'll pull me aside and tell me how proud. I mean, he was awkward about telling his son that he loves him. I mean, that, that's another thing. Uh, we never really uh, told each other I love you or any of that. There was like no emotions. In fact, when I worked for him, we didn't hang out in the holidays. When, when Christmas came around, we just, and then we went back to work when it was done. Uh, he had retired and I had guys working for me and one of them is Sam. Uh, he noticed that one time dad came in and we were talking and we kind of gave an awkward hug to each other. You know, cause things, our relationships were a lot better. And uh, he left and Sam's like, you never really hugged your dad, did you? And I said, no, <laughs> That's, this is cool. I'm finally getting to, uh, a relationship with him where we should have had and uh, and it just wasn't there when when I was growing up working for him I mean it was we were, it was a screaming match but I wouldn't change a thing because the discipline that he taught me and he taught me to run it as a business uh, not to screw off not to you know the customers come first you keep them happy and you work your ass off and that's and that's what I did but now I mean he just it's a whole different person. Get along. It's, a, it's a good thing now. Oh, it's wonderful. It's, and again, I wouldn't change anything. You know, and then when he left, I grew the shop bigger because I had ideas. You know, I watched him. I, I, I listened to him. I listened to uh, his buddies that had successful businesses, and I paid attention to all that. Once he left, man, I maxed out two credit cards, bought all the equipment I needed. Um, he left me the, and that's how I took the shop over. He's like, all right, let's have a seat and let's talk about this. He says, I'm moving to Sierra Vista. Here's how it's going to go down. And at that point, he handed me a lease. He says, lease is up. Go ahead and if you want to take this place over, you, we'll put the lease in your name. I said, okay. Anyhow, he took off and boom, I, I maxed out credit. I had equipment coming in. I had all the people that we were turning these jobs down for turnkey cars. I was calling them up. They were bringing the cars in. So I immediately overnight loaded the car or loaded the whole shop up with uh, projects and big projects. And then I started, uh, you know, months before he left, I had people coming by looking for work. And this was just at the climbing economy. It was 2004. So okay. things were doing good and people were wanting to spend money. So this, this worked out really good. So that's in a nutshell, follow my dad's footsteps as best I could. No, yeah. that's that's perfect. That's, yeah, that's that's a good thing. Yeah, you you've been involved in in two big projects in uh, in, in in the hot riding world and in, in our world. Uh, you have the Detroit Autorama, the Riddler, and then at Pomona, you know my stomping ground. We have uh, the Grand National Roadster Show, which is America's most beautiful roadster, and you've been involved in in both of them. So. Um, the Riddler. Uh, well, let's talk about that first. Let's just okay. talk about what you what you went after. I mean, that was that's a massive project right there. That's because it was. But when we started that project, there was no intentions for the Riddler. That wasn't the plan because you can't show it off. I mean, it's one of those. It just kind of has to be in high. Right, action. but even I mean, that whole project when the customer came to me and it had been at another shop, he wasn't happy with it, and and uh, of course when it got to us, it just snowballed into this. But a lot of the ideas on that car came from the customer. And again, I, I try to do things to keep the customer happy and try to build their dreams, how they like to see stuff. I mean, there's some of the stuff on the car, uh, like the engine, that was his idea. Like, hey, I was at SEMA and Aries makes heads for an LS1. I'm like, wow, that's awesome. Well, I bought them. So and that, now we're dealing with that. You know what I mean? It, it, he just 
it snowballed. Okay. And it got to a point where, and again, we do as much as we can in house, but if I feel it's a little over our head, I'll give it to the right guy. Um, Matt Tom in Phoenix is an incredible metal man, uh, and he's nearby. I gave him the job to do uh, a lot of the metal fab on as far as the interior stuff. Like when we got the car, it has this late model Malibu dash in it, and, and whoever put it in just cut the ends off and crammed it in there, and now we got to make that work. So, you know, but so we had an idea of what to make, but we, we weren't capable of forming that sheet metal. I mean, we, we do form metal here, but I mean, if we're going to make stuff like that, I'd rather give it to guys more efficient. And sure. So I give it to Matt Tom, and what he did was uh, he took the ends of the dash and formed them out of aluminum and, and epoxied them and blended them onto the door. And then, of course, while it was over there, the customer's like, why don't we do this? And next thing you know, we're uh, I believe Jimmy did some renderings of some of the stuff that was done, like the uh, Jimmy Smith. He, he he built this like tonneau in the back, you know, with all these. And this is the customer. He just snowballs. This thing just got bigger and bigger. And next thing you know, the, the tailgate's opening with a motor, and then the the back of the inside opens, and the tonneau comes up all with motors. Which, I mean, if it was up to me, I wouldn't do it. It's just it's a nightmare of of uh, engineering. Well, Matt did all that and it works great and it kept, that's what the customer wanted, great. So that type of stuff, we gave it to Matt and then the car started really getting character. I mean, it wasn't what he was, I think, set out to do in the beginning. Um, I suggested, let's do the um, 54 Chevy front bumper and 55 Chevy rear bumper. And of course we did the sheet metal to fit all that and Matt Tom helped on some of that too. And then with the engine and all that, this thing just really started coming together. And then I talked him into, uh, well, shoot, we might as well do a one-off wheel. Uh, Jimmy was involved with that. Um, and we had Mike Curtis uh, cut the wheels for us. Yeah, the next thing you know, this thing's just coming together. And it's incredible, uh, the amount of hours and all of just this, the detail that's going into this car. And like originally, I think the underside was just going to be blacked out. Next thing you know, we were upside down painting the floor and building these, this belly pan. I mean, whoever welded the, the floor into the car when we got it, it was pretty warped. So I just suggested, well, why don't we build a belly pan in, in this Art Morrison chassis to hide all that stuff. And when you look under, it's all flat with the rockers. And so we did all this stuff. And the next thing you know, customers go, I think I want to go to Riddler with it. And of course, I'm, I'm not. I don't know. Uh, the Riddler thing, it, it's awesome. It's tough to, to imagine like, God, these guys have spent all this money to get a, I mean, it's the same old thing. You've heard it, like, all this money to get this trophy. And 10 grand, I think it is, isn't it? 10, 20 grand? I think so. Yeah, and, and it's like, well, me personally, I like to build a car and, and drive the hell out of it, beat the hell out of it. I'm hard on my own cars, I really am. Uh, my dad tells me that, I'm really hard on my cars, but. Um, I have more fun that way. I get to enjoy them. And this, so we're building this, and I'm there to keep the customer happy. Okay, shoot, let's do the uh, Riddler thing. And, and I'm just like new to all that. I've never been to Riddler, but I never researched it to find out what it takes to win or what, nothing. I knew nothing about it. So, I mean, so the, the owner is doing all the research. Well, we got to do this, and we have to be there at this time. And then we have, no, and he's, I'm like, okay, and I'm just following along, and I'm doing everything, the shop's doing everything to the best we can. Okay, this is Riddler, so this is gonna be nuts. We gotta, we can't overlook anything. I mean, there's every little tiny piece and bracket and uh, parts have gotta be chromed or polished or hand, I mean, just nuts. But, but, but that's what the Riddler is, they, they wanna see right. that. Um, pretty modest about all, them, all the things we do, you know? I mean, you get so damn used to doing it, and used to that car and all these hours you're putting in it, you never really stand back and look at it. I mean, you look at it in a hole, but if it's somebody new coming in the door, they've never seen the car, they go, wow. It was an amazing piece. Right, but to me it's like, oh, well this, you know, I gotta do this and you look at all, and you're so concentrated on the, the build of the car, you don't really get the impact that it creates when somebody sees it for the first time. So, and you know, these cars that they got out at Riddler are just, Phenomenal. The amount of time and money that goes into them are just unbelievable. 
So I never really, I never really was into, well, let's build a Riddler car or anything like that. So, so it was all a new experience for me. So anyhow, we ended up, uh, the owner trailered the car up there and he, he, we helped him get a display set up and, and build all that. And, um, and then me and the guy who works for me that uh, did most of the assembly work on it, we, he flew us up uh, to Detroit and uh, never been to Detroit. And so it, it was, you know, you walk in and, and here's your car and, and you're proud of it. I was very proud of what we did. And I was very proud of uh, the quality and the detail and, and it's great. But then you walk in and see everything and you're like, holy, I mean, I can't believe. Some heavy hitters here. Yeah, I'm like, I'm not so sure if we should be here. I mean, that's how you feel. Um, and, and the owner's like, all I want is grade eight. If I get grade eight, I'll be, I'll be so happy. And I was like, uh, man, all these cars are just over the top. I, I, don't, I didn't say it to him. I didn't want to say, hey, man, they, these, guys, they, these guys, I mean, this is crazy. And believe me, the owner spent a lot of money on this car. Now, and, people that don't know, you know, the grade eight, there's, they pick eight to go to the final deal. I don't know how many right. cars showed up at that. At that I don't at know that. how many that year, but it was quite a few. So, and, and quite a few. Because that is beautiful always, cars that deserve. That's pretty it. much an honor to be grade eight. I mean, oh, just to it get was to huge. That, to that cutoff, that's a, that's a big deal. That's, right. Yeah, there's no messing around to get into. Yeah, that if group. you're grade eight, that's awesome. Yes. I mean, that's well, obviously the only thing better would be winning the Riddler. Right. So, when he called us that one morning and said we did it, we got grade eight. I was just like floored. I'm he was, like, he was happy. That's what oh, he was. he was completely happy. I made the guy happy. And don't get me wrong, I'm totally proud of the car. The car just came out beautiful. It's everything he expected. Uh, he got the grade eight with it, and that's all he wanted. Um, and and so that was just that was the, another cool experience in the hot rod world. And what was cool about that show is we had the grade eight, and they did the whole uh, award ceremony, and we came back out, and we're standing around the car. John Buck from uh, rod shows that does uh, America's Most Beautiful Roaster and Grand National Roaster Show. He walks up and we start talking and, and uh, he says, uh, he's asking me, hey, do you know about Builder of the Year program? I'm like, oh yeah, you guys have that every year at your show. And he's like, well, you're it for 2016. I was like, so I, oh, I was like, way. yeah, <laughs> by the way, so I got floored with that too, which was huge. So, you know, all that, all that happened in one great weekend it was, it was really a good experience and you know just looking at all those cars you can't only because we build cars that you can look at all the stuff there and realize the the amount of hours and talent and knowledge it took to do these cars it's just incredible nowhere in, in the world does people i mean don't get me wrong in other countries they, they're into hot rods and stuff but it's in this country that we build these we have such a strong passion that we build these incredible pieces of art that, you know, just when you think they're seen in all the next uh, Detroit show you go to, there somebody just went over to the top again. It's like this bar keeps going up. Well, most people don't realize that, that there's years. This is nothing you're going to do in oh, six no. months. You couldn't do it in a year. No. And, and then you figure out the average build for a Riddler car, you're going to have 20,000 hours. Easy. Well, if you told somebody to figure out, just, you know, figure out 20,000 hours, just sit down and figure that out. You know, if you're working 40 hours a week mm -hmm. as one person, you, and you, could, you, several, even do it, could you even do it in your lifetime? You know, that's, right. it's one of those kind of things. So there's so many people that are involved and there's cars that, you know, they have 30,000 hours. So you go, <laughs> you know, why did it cost so much? Because it's time. And passion. It's just, it's just. It takes a lot of passion lot to be to that, that devoted and to keep that train moving and keep that yes. project going. To the end, and I that, mean that, that takes last, an that, immense amount and that of passion. Last six and, months is the hardest oh, yeah. ever because yeah. now you've got the big checklist done, and now you're just working all these little itty details that right. don't ever end. And everybody thinks that everything just goes as planned throughout the whole build. Yeah. You're not redoing anything. <laughs> There's so many things you have to redo because just the the idea is there and you put it together it doesn't work. I mean I got shelves full of stuff there it just didn't work. Didn't work. And we can't charge the customer for that because it didn't work sits on the shelf. Well, what are we going to do? Are you going to throw it away? Can't throw it away. I got too much money into the damn thing. And it may go to something else. We <laughs> yeah. may use it. It may work nah, on something got, else. No, nah, that stuff, it could easily be thrown away, but you, you just okay. can't. You just because... can't make yourself do it. Mm -mm. Gotcha. <laughs> no, it, it, it takes 
a lot of knowledge, a lot of planning, a lot of passion, I think is the biggest, uh, to be able to do something like that. So the Riddler show is just this, um, Detroit Autorama is just this huge event on the East Coast that, I mean, that's the place to go. That's the, the trophy to compete for. And, and uh, people go pretty far to get it. And of course, you mentioned Grand National on the yes. West Coast. Let's let's talk. Yes, let's talk about the Grand National. Let's uh, because that one you did win. We did. But but how you did it is is funny. It's it's a pretty good story. How you is that was definitely well. Not we part competed. Of your plan. I, the first time I competed with uh, AMBR was with my own roaster in two thousand eight. Um, I've always loved the Grand National Roaster Show. It's my favorite show. I, I mean, it's just. It's cool because the quality of the cars and just you know the layout in Southern California and the people, it's just such a cool vibe. I mean, it's something, I make sure I go to two shows every year, Grand National and LA Roadster. Those are my big shows and of course good guys, but that's local. So 08, I was finishing up a cream and red 32 that I've been building for seven years. See, it takes seven years if it's your own car yes. because you work on it on your own time. You can work on it. Right. So. Anyhow, I, I was finishing up this Roadster, and uh, I got a hold of, of, of uh, someone over at Rod Shows, I think it was probably the secretary or something, I was like, hey, I, and again, I didn't know how to enter a car, never entered a car there. I always went, but never entered a car. And uh, I'm like, hey, I got this Roadster, I wanna put it in the show. And they're like, well, you need to send over photos, fill out the application, so I did, and I sent all that over. Boom, John Buck calls me. Why don't we put this in uh, AMBR? I'm like, well, I didn't think it was worthy of that, you know, and oh, absolutely, and you need to, we'll put you in as a contender. Uh, so I did, and uh, and that was a hell of an experience, because again, I'd never done it, and I was on my own. I mean, I'm on a budget. I, I got, uh, this was an 08, so it's like, um, I'm running the shop by myself, I'm calling all the shots, but I think I can afford to take the car over and spend a week over there, because it does take a week uh, to get it set up and all that. So. When I got the car all set up uh, the next day, well, I told you earlier, I got, you know, they give you a pamphlet of like all the rules and stuff you got to do. And, and one of them is you got to be out of your display at 11 o'clock, I think it is, on Friday. And the show starts at noon and you can't get in your display, you're disqualified. So I show up at noon because I never read anything. Um, I never really took the time to read. So, I mean, I read, but I just don't like to. So right. I get there at noon. And I noticed there's a little bit of a coolant drip up on uh, the display underneath my car. So I pull my shoes off to jump in to clean it up and one of the judges is standing there and says, what are you doing? I said, well, I gotta get that coolant drip wiped off. He says, you get in there, we will have to disqualify you. I'm like, crap. So, I mean, that's stuff you just, now I'm learning this right. whole AMBR thing. And uh, anyhow, uh, at the end of the, the weekend, another guy had taken it, but it was a great experience, and I was hooked. I'm like, man, I gotta get this trophy. This would be awesome. So the next year, we competed again, and this time it was with a customer's car, and it was really cool. And there was some controversy that year about who won, and that, and that, it kind of soured your taste a little bit about how it went down, but um, that's a whole other story. But anyhow, we competed again next year. Oh no, I'm sorry, that was, 2000, yeah, 2008, I competed with my car. 2009, I had brought a customer's 40 Ford that we'd finished. And then in 2010, we brought the Orange Roadster to compete. And again, it was a controversial winner, whatever. That's fine. So the next year, 2011, we don't have anything completed. I gotta tell you the story about the Roadster. So the Roadster, this 34 Roadster, is owned by Daryl Woolswinkle. Back during the hot rod connection, uh, my dad was building this roadster for Daryl. Daryl had bought the roadster at Pomona Swap Meet, and it was just a Jenny hot rod, you know. Early. This is the same car. We're talking yeah. about mm -hmm. the same car. Same okay. car. Right. So anyhow, dad built this roadster for Daryl, and it was just beautiful. It had a small block Chevy with Inglis Weber's that. Oh, nice. Yeah, washed the cylinders down the first round, just <laughs> killed the engine. But so he painted it this uh, Mercedes maroon, and. Uh, and it has some 80s things going on, like the dash, it had the Marfab insert 
uh, gauge insert with the VDO gauges, and then some aluminum blades and this credit card ignition. Do you remember that? Where you right. Had that. It had uh, the tail light. Uh, the tail pan had the same blades on it, and all the tail lights were behind it. These aluminum eighth inch aluminum blades, like a grill, and they had them on the hood sides too. It had a set of Mihalik wheels, the the knockoff uh, right. Dave Mihalik wheels, um, and then he built these uh, headlights that are quick quick disconnect, and, and so you can run the car like without any headlights because it looks good. So he did all this. I mean, they wedge channeled it. They did all this cool work to this car. It was such a bitching car. And it was hand finished in lacquer and, uh, you know, finished all the piece around the back of the seat. Just, I remember my dad leading that and filing that out. And the fit and finish is just flawless. Dan Drum did the upholstery. You remember Dan Drum? No. He did upholsteries and, and jobs like back in the 80s and 90s and was like doing stuff for these high dollar cars. Anyhow, Dan Drum did the upholstery and I think. At the time, it was like eight grand, and people were like flipping out that it was an $8,000 upholstery job in a roadster, which today, I mean, they get twice that. So, well, now we go back, it's time. All it is is time. It is. And, and I, we get it now. Yeah, I, mean, but I mean, you look at it and you go, oh, right. it's like, how many hours do they think I have in the interior? It wasn't just right. do some door panels. He had some time. In oh, this. absolutely. Ooh, he was very much a craftsman and, and fit and finish everything because the whole car fit beautifully. Okay. I mean, the gaps were Ferrari style, hand fit, perfect. And that's how the car was. Well, Daryl, we got the car finished and Daryl, um, I think one of the intentions was uh, AMBR, but they never did it. They just decided, nah, let's just go have fun with it and drive it. And so Daryl kept it for a few years. Anyhow, Daryl decided to sell the car. So the car went to Florida. He, someone over there bought it. He bought the truck, the trailer, the car, everything. Went to Florida. So much for the roaster, it's gone. So we kind of kept track of where it went. It went from there, and then I think uh, there's a guy, I think, that ended up with it in Texas. In fact, I think he had some cars built by Boyd. And then from there, it went to another guy. So this guy had it. Anyhow, that guy called. Oh, shoot, it was right after my dad left, and he was asking about the paint because he needed some touch-up. Um, anyhow, I'm talking about the car. I'm like, yeah, you'd ever want to sell it. And he's like, yeah, I'd think about it, you know customer of mine, good friend. I said, hey, you looking for a 34 Roadster? He's like, yeah. I said, well, I know the one, and I told him the whole story about my dad building this car, and yeah, I found it, and it was possibly for sale. He's like, yeah, I'd be interested in it. So I called the guy back. So I'm, I remember at the old shop, I'm sitting there, I'm by myself in the shop, I think it might have been, like right at, it might have been during lunch, all the guys are gone. I'm on the phone with this guy, and he's like, yeah, I, you know, we, he agreed, and this is what he wants for a price. I'm like, okay, I'll let him know. I got a phone. And I swear, and this is the weirdest thing, 20 minutes later, Daryl come walking in, the original owner. And I hadn't seen Daryl in months. I said, hey, I said, it's funny you walk in. And he says, uh, why? I said, well, I found your old Roadster in Texas. And uh, he said, really? I said, yeah, I got a customer uh, that's looking for a Roadster, and, and he's thinking about buying it. And Daryl says, well, how much does he want? And I told him. He says, get him back on the phone and tell him I want it. I said, what? He says, Texas is one thing, but I'll be damned if someone's gonna drive my roaster in my hometown. So Daryl ended up buying the car and we get it back. And it, it's, it's old. I mean, it went from, I think Daryl sold it in uh, early 90s, early to mid 90s. Anyhow, now it's like 2004, 2005, um, maybe even 2006, he buys it. No, it was 2005, he bought it back and it's just wore out. You know, the engines wore out, so we put a crate 350 in it for him. We took the goofy wheels off. We contacted the guy who had the original Helix. We bought those back, put them on it, and basically set it back up the way he had it when my dad finished. And he drove it like that for a year. And then in 06, a year later, he says, I want to redo the roaster. I said, okay. And uh, I said, well, here's my ideas. And I, immediately I want to cut off all the 80s stuff you know, the grill stuff and the tail light and goofy right. stuff. I like, I need to, I want to put different wheels on it. And, you know, the Helix were 14s and 15s. I'm like, yeah, let's use Rotter's wheels 15 and, and 16s, you know, and give it more of a updated look. I said, I think black would be best. And he says, well, I want to put a Ford engine in it. I said, okay. So we tear this whole car apart. And my dad catches wind and he's not real happy about, you know, me cutting all of his creative stuff he did on the car, but uh, we started making changes on it, and uh, we had this killer engine built. I mean, it was a uh, 
can't remember the horsepower, but it was up there. It was like 600 plus horse uh, with Hillborn injection. Just beautiful. And we decided to hand brush everything. So in 06, we're putting this together. Well, we finish it in 08. We finished the car. Yeah, because we started in 06, took every bit of 07. In 08, we finished the car. And it's just an awesome car. Just It sounds great. It drives great. It just sets good. It looks cool. And of course, but the original build of my dad's car is still there. It's still got all the customizing he did as far as wedge channel. And, and uh, we left a lot of things in place. But we took just kind of the 80s stuff out right. of it. Anyhow, my dad, he admitted, yeah, it, it looks good. you know. And so anyhow, Daryl just puts it in his hangar. He has an airplane hangar. And there it's set. So come 2011. I'm like, man, we need to bring something to the show. And I called Daryl. I'm like, hey, I don't have anything to bring this year because I, I try to bring something every year. Um, it's really funny about the hot rod world. If you miss one year of bringing a car, everybody thinks you're closed. So I, it's weird. They're like, what happened to squeegees? They don't have a car here this year. They must have went under. So I always try to bring something every year. It doesn't matter. It's a crazy goal. <laughs> well, but I dig it anyway. Right. It's my favorite show. So hey, can we borrow the Roadster? I want to take it to uh, Grand National. He's like, yeah, sure, come get it. So we had, from the year before, we had a display of another car we did, a 33 Woody. Um, so we borrowed the display. We're like, okay, we'll just use this old display. So I sent pictures to Buck. And, and at this time, they changed the rules of the showing, and I didn't realize that. Nobody told me. You know, you just kind of, well, I'm going to bring it to the show. And, and my whole intention of bringing that was not to win anything. I just wanted to promote the shop right that's the that's the best way to promote the shop is that show i mean it, it's such a great show so buck says yeah we'll put it in a contender or whatever so i get there and i'm like the last guy to, to get there and i go up and i'm like here i'm here with i'm doug jerger with the roadster and, uh, and pete shaboris walks up he's like yeah why don't you go ahead and unload it and drive it right around here okay I'm like, all right over that way yeah so I unload it fire it off and everybody comes running because it sounds so good so as soon as we light it in the trailer, I look behind me and there's just people. So we unload it and I drive around like he wants me to and I park it. He's like, yeah, just park it there. And so I did and I shut it off. And as I'm getting out of the car, all the judges are surrounded. And I'm looking around, I'm like, oh, these are guys I know. That's Kugel, there's Shaporis, there's, I think, I can't remember who else was there. I know Brennan was there and, and a couple others. And all these guys I look up to in the hot rodding world. I mean, I've read about them since I was a kid. I was reading Hot Rod Magazine, Street Rod, or Rod Action, all those magazines, and I studied it. I mean, I studied the pictures, I knew the people that did it, and here they all are. Standing around the car. Standing around the car. I'm like, awesome. So they start asking, they're asking me about this car. I'm like, wow. You know, I'm just like, I think I was, might have been blushing a little bit, and like, wow. So I get out of the car, and I shut the door, and I forget who it was, might have been Pete. He says, uh, can you open that door again? Yeah, shut it. Click, and it shuts really nice. I mean, it's got these latches and it's click. I mean, it's just awesome. Yeah, can you show him? Tell me a little bit about the car. So I explained to him, I'm, I'm telling him the story, kind of what I just said about how the car uh, was built by dad. And, you know, I made a few changes and dad was a little pissed off. I took some of his stuff off, but you know, here it is. And and uh, so they're, they're all over the car looking at it. and asking questions and I'm happily, I'm like talking to them like, this is cool, I get to talk to these guys, you know? Cause when you go to shows and see them, you just kind of look in the background, I know him, that's Pete Shapiro. Right. So anyhow, they're like, okay, well you can go set up your display and you can display the car however you want. I'm like, really? I said, I don't have to pull a wheel off or, nope, you can leave the hood shut if you want and the door shut. Awesome, that's how I like to see a car displayed anyway. Well, it looks like a car. It, it looks like a car. And you can't see what it is. Yeah, that's what my dad like. always says. He's like, yeah. look at that thing. It looks like someone threw a hand grenade in it and all yeah. the doors yeah, and shit's open. Yeah, you can't see it. Up. I want to see the car. Right, and that's what I like to see. So I'm like, cool. I told the guys, I'm like, awesome. Let's park the car, pull the one hood panel off, and I decide, leave the headlights off because it looks cool without headlights. So we pulled one hand pa hood panel, but we left the top shut. So on, on one side of the car, you get the whole profile of the car and how it right. looks. On the other side, you can see this bitching uh, small block fuel injected Ford, you know, and then we set our show sign up and boom, let's go drink beer because we're not here, we're not going to win. I mean, look at all the cars. They're just cool cars up for a contender. I'm like, well, let's just have fun. And that's what we do. We go there, we put our car up and 
we usually get there in the morning, clean them up. But this time, I don't know, maybe we had too much beer. We never got there in the morning. And, you know, by the end of the weekend, there was like a layer of dust on the car. We were neglecting keeping it clean. But again, we're just here, there to promote. We're not there to try to win any event or anything or any trophies. So, so it gets to awards. And they have, you know, at the end of the show, they bring all the contenders up on stage. Okay, and then they hand out everybody a plaque and you're lined up on this stage and you're looking, I mean, it's like this, lights, and you're looking at all the whole audience and you're just like, this is. I'm so, in, yeah, in, I've been I'm here in, before. I'm with the group, the, yeah, I've, cool. I've been here before, but I'm pretty sure I'm just gonna get my plaque and we gotta go. <laughs> so, and, and the way Grand National works, they start, giving awards out for all the, uh, I think there were 12 roasters that year, and, and they start handing out awards. If you win best engine, you didn't get the big one. You, if you won best paint, you didn't get the big one, if, and so on. Right. So best engine, I'm like, wow, that guy won best engine. Oh. And best paint, oh, shoot. And you're not that. thinking about No, I'm yeah. thinking, <laughs> they're at least give me best right. interior yeah, or something. I got robbed. So I'm holding my plaque, and then I'm like, I'm pretty sure it's all of it. So. I kind of lean forward and look down the line and I'm like, who's left here? Who's gonna get this thing? And I turn back around and here stands a trophy check here. And I look and I turn around, there's another trophy truck check and I went, and boom, he announces it. And I, I turned white. All my, there's only like five or six of us left because everybody left, it was wing and win. And they're all yelling. They said, I just turned white and I was in shock. And, and I really was. I think when he handed me the trophy, I damn near dropped, or I might have dropped my plaque. I was so shaking. And John Buck, he's like, do you want to say anything? I'm like, uh, and he's like, nah, you don't have to say anything. And so I was just like, wow, I can't believe we won. Um, off, so, of a, off of a fluke, just, it just, we're just going to go have fun. Sure, we'll bring the car, right. we'll have a little display. Let's go Oh yeah, fun. we didn't even have a display. The car we're sat on the carpet and, and we won. I didn't have any trick lights or anything, oh, just sitting that's there. Awesome. And I'm just like, Lord, this is like, this honestly was the greatest hot rod moment of my life. It, it hands down was. And all the guys ran over and they're cleaning the car off because of all the dust and they're hauling the trophy over to the display. And, and, and here's all these photographers all around me and I'm just still in shock holding this trophy with the big trophy. I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe, I can't believe we won. So that was just an awesome event. And and one of the most memorable events of my life as far as the hot rod world. And uh, we competed again, I think, one other time. Yeah, one other time with another car. We didn't get it, but it, it's just a great experience. Well, sir, I, uh, I thank you very much for telling your story. This is, okay. this is some good stuff. I had fun. Well, you're welcome. That was, uh, was a lot of fun. Sure, this isn't Jurgens. Can you conjugate that? 
Jurgo, Jurgas, Jurgen, Jurgamos. Just what in the hell is a squeeg? So uh, let me get this correct here. You got this, uh, this, this Doug guy. His name is Squeeg. Squeeg. Like, like Squiggy. Squiggy from that, that, that show with the beer ladies. Yeah, I like that show. That's a pretty good show. You ever see that? Yeah, the one where the guy's like, hey, Lenny. And he's like, Squiggy, Squeegy. I'm going to assume that, uh, that my, my motivation here is uh, to, to pronounce. I don't even know how you say this hair. Squig? Squig? Yeah, I got to swallow the E's in that one. Squig. Squig. You got to push them out. Squig. Sounds like something. That's something happened down on the farm. I would tell you about the time we was out there and I, like the, the the pigeons and stuff like that was floating about. Right. So you're saying, oh, the microphone. Oh, the microphone's over here. Hi. <laughs> Hello, microphone. Ah, Mesa, Arizona. I know it well. Yeah. That, I never tell you about the time my cousin got pregnant out there. Yeah. Yeah. So what we should do is probably swing that microphone. Just, uh, thank you. Okay. That, that that'll work. Oh, dude, that'd be a great intro for us. Let's come up with a riddle for this one here. What has two paint cans in the morning, three gallons of Bondo in the afternoon? Um, I'm not exactly sure who wrote this, but uh, this is way above my pay grade. Hey, do you have a brother? I mean, this is a little off topic, but if you look down at it, really, okay, they've got belt loops, right? Why are there no tie loops? Oh, oh, m m more dramatic? You want dramatic? I'll give you dramatic. Here, here's your dramatic. All right, 14 hours. I'm sitting here trying to record this thing. You behind the glass just giving me crap. Yeah, stop it. For more stories and podcasts, go to www.round6pod.com.